Go ahead, Alina. Um, I'm sorry, Rob. I I need you to record because I'm can't find the setting. We are recording. Go ahead, Alina. Yes, we are recording. <laughs> Hi, everyone, to the SAME Young Professionals CI webinar. Um, before we and I see that people are still um, jumping into this meeting, so um, uh, I'll you know go over a couple things before we jump into the webinar itself. Um, but again, thanks for joining us. Let's see. Um, it's keeping for our, um, I know that um, a few of us are new to them, so some people might also be having issues connecting, but um, as uh, we're going through the webinar, um, if you could mute your if you've got any, um, you know, call, please use the chat feature on the right side of your window um, as we're going through the presentation. If there are any specific questions, please add those questions to the Q&A tab that is also found on the right side of the window. Um, and then again, as uh, you your specific questions, uh, for one of our speakers, um, please note who that, that question should go to. Um, and then we are recording this webinar, so if for some reason you need to jump off early or if you know anybody who might be interested in um, viewing this at a later time, um, the recording and the slide deck will be available after uh, we are done today. And you can find that on the SME website. Um, under the education portion of the site, as well as the young professionals um, specific site as well. Um, next slide. Um, before we get started, um, you'll see a um, poll pop up right now if you could answer um, based on who has joined us just so we can get an idea of who we have on the call today, that'd be great. Okay, we've got people answering. Um, uh, while I give people a chance to answer this as well, um, before we get into our webinar, for those that um, are not familiar with the Young Professional COI, uh, we do have a monthly call on the second Thursday of every month. So if anybody is looking to get in, engaged with SAME or the Young Professionals COI, I encourage you to join our call. Um, even if it's just to listen in, um, you'll listen to some of the opportunities that um, are available to uh, SAME members. And uh, we are uh, kind of ramping up for our involvement at JETC uh, later this year. And so uh, there are some good opportunities to, to engage there as well. Um, so if you're interested, um, please um, join us on our monthly call. Okay, so just based on the poll results, let's see, most, well, there's, you know, there's a handful of everybody, but um, I think the highest one is large business, so companies over 2,000 employees, um, so that's great to hear. Okay, so our webinar today, or our topic is titled Pitfalls and Opportunities for Electric Vehicles at Government Installations. Um, we are fortunate to have three speakers uh, join us today to talk about this topic. Um, Rob, Rob McAtee, Jason O'Neill, and Matt Bianco. I will um, pass it over to them to do their own introductions. So, uh, gentlemen, thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to us today. Okay, I guess I'm first. Um, my name is Matt Bianco. Um, I'm with Fedway Consulting. Uh, I did work for the, the market leader in, in charging infrastructure, ChargePoint, for four years, handling their federal accounts. Um, and since then, I'm independent, and I've kind of uh, morphed into somewhat of an integrator when it comes to federal agencies. Um, so I work with uh, on-grid, off-grid technologies, with uh, electrical installers. You know, I par partner with lots of different groups. Uh, I've, I've worked very closely over the years, dating back to about 2014 with GSA, 
uh, their office of fleet. There was a, an executive order back uh, in the early days, 13693, to electrify the fleet. Uh, and, and now we've got a couple of other new executive orders and sustainability reports and, and goals to hit uh, for the federal fleet. Um, but also they want to start putting POVs. Um, so GOVs are the federal fleet. POVs are the are the personal vehicles. So um, there's something called the FAST Act that allows that. So I've become somewhat of a thought leader and expert on that. We'll get into that in my presentation. Um, but I've been working with military, civilian and intel agencies uh, for now seven, eight years. Uh, so looking forward to sharing my knowledge with the group. I'm Rob McAtee. I'm with Mason and Hanger. We're an architectural and engineering company that uh, primarily works with the federal government. I currently head up our engineering and sustainability group, which is uh, all things related to engineering and sustainability, as you might guess, but uh, increasingly uh, really focused on energy resilience, energy security, and um, renewable energy uh, battery energy storage, and uh, also electric vehicles are a, a big part of that. Um, and that's that's about it. Uh, Jason? Good afternoon. My name is Jason O'Neill. I work with SES Green Solutions. We're a full-service electrical contractor based out of the DMV area. Uh, and we specifically have pivoted mostly into electric vehicle charging stations over the last few years because the growth has been so much there. My background, I started out in the Navy as an officer. I'm still in the reserves now. I was an EA-6B prowler backseater before that got retired and I moved into the Navy's meteorology and oceanography program. And after coming off active duty, I've been working in the contracting field, specifically in sustainability contracting and EV chargers since then. So learning objectives today, I'm not going to go through all of these, but basically what we're trying to give you is an overview of exactly what EV charging stations are, kind of what you're looking for when you're talking to customers about this, how that relates to the federal government contracting and how the, the new executive orders coming down and the new funding coming available is gonna be really pushing this into the federal sphere. So EV equipment uh, and installation, I'll start that off. So why are we here? The no major industry is gonna change more over the next decade than transportation. We're already seeing this uh, as we move forward with uh, the, the addition of electric vehicle charging stations and EVs in areas like DC and LA, that's really starting to spread out past there. It's getting now where all the autom automobile manufacturers are making this a key point of how they're moving forward. And we're starting to see that in the federal government. And from my point of view, I've seen a lot with city, county, and state as well. To get all these EVs on the road, there's a lot of infrastructure that's going to have to go into that. That's the EVSC, electrical vehicle char uh, charging infrastructure. And it's going to really do a lot to how we have to think about how we're going to change our power grid, how we're going to change how the cars are built, and eventually how we're going to be able to use those cars to help push that energy back to the grid and kind of take up some of the energy from renewables. So getting familiar with EV charging, you've probably heard level two or fast charging at some point. And right now there's three different types of EV charging, level one, level two, and level three. Level one, you can kind of think of that as what we call a trickle charge. You're essentially plugging an extension cord uh, into your car in your garage. It will charge, but it's going to take 20, 30 hours to do it. Uh, most of what we're seeing right now is level two charging, which is using the J1772 plug. And that is a universal plug for every electrical vehicle on the market right now can plug into that. Teslas can also plug into that. They have a special adapter so that they can do so. And that is really where most charging is going to be happening. And that gives you about 25 miles of range per hour of charge. So that's good for plugging in at work at an office building. That's good for uh, home charging as well. Now, DC fast charging, this is the level three charging. This is where we're starting to talk about filling up a whole car in 20 to 25 minutes, maybe even less, depending on, on how much power is being given out. There is a place of these chargers. Uh, you see them a lot with bus depots, um, highway charging on roadside. If you're looking at warehouse trucks, uh, anything that's going to be running 24 seven, that's kind of where you need level three. And the reasoning behind why we don't just do level three everywhere, we'll get into a little bit more later on, but it is orders of magnitude more expensive to do a level three install than a level two install. So why smart charging stations? So the difference between a smart and a dumb charger is essentially that it's networked. So with a network station, you're able to look at uh, the owner of the stations can look at a dashboard and see 
how many stations are in use at any given time. Uh, they can change whether they want the public or the private or private set to be able to access them. They can lock out the public if they want to. They can change pricing, start it out as free and increase as it goes throughout the day. They can track their power and energy management. Uh, and then they can have an integrated video display actually on a lot of these stations itself. So you can get out the word about upcoming events, um, emergency things that might be happening with that. Now, most of the rebates available and tax credits available in the US right now, they have to be smart charging stations. And that's basically because the utilities want to be able to get that information and see just how much they're being used. But it's also for the owners. Now, if you can look at your station utilization and see that you know they're in use 78% of the time, you probably know that you need to add stations to that. If you have a dumb charge, which essentially just you plug in and get power out of it, you don't have any um, uh, visibility on that as well. So one other thing I want to point out before I move on is with smart charging, when we're talking about a networked solution, these stations are on their own network. The owner, the station owners will access them through an independent dashboard online. They do not integrate into federal um, building management systems. They are not going to be into the computer systems that your customers are going to be using. So there is no security concern that someone's going to be able to hack into a station and then get into a federal network. They are completely separate. Right, this is an example of what an EV dashboard looks like. Uh, you can see you know, how many stations, how many ports are being used for all of your stations, real-time power that's being kicked out, um, average session length, financials, how much you're expecting to make over the next course of the month um, for your owners with that. You can see how many different unique drivers you have. Is it the same five people that are charging every day or is that really rotating through? And for a lot of the lead, recommend, um, lead requirements and other environmental requirements, you can see you know, amount of CO2 emissions that are being um, held back because of these EV charging stations um, and really kind of what their positive use is for you know, sustainability. So this dashboard is a big part of what you get when you have a smart charging station. So what else to look out for? Now, I get these questions a lot when I'm doing installs. People get very hung up about the cost of the charging station, um, but they need to be thinking about what they're going to look like as well. So we, we have examples here in the the top and the right, uh, cable management is something not a lot of owners think about, but can the cable retract into the station itself? Now, the, a lot of these stations, they can't do that. And you end up with cords all over the ground. And not only does that look bad to, for your owner, for their nice new EV charging installation, but they get run over, they get covered in ice and they start to uh, break down a lot faster. On newer stations, those, and those cords will retract into the station itself. And it's just something a lot of owners don't know to ask for. Um, these top ones here are from a mixed use uh, development in Montgomery County, Maryland, and they are less than two years old and the owners already looking to rip them out and put in new ones just because of their, the way that they look. All right, so now we're going to get a little bit into the nitty gritty of how you actually install these things. So you talked about level two and level three. Level two, you need 80 amp circuits for a dual port. So that's 40 amps per each. The level three, that can be up to 125 amps, 500 kilowatts of the 480 volts is what they're going to be using. Now, not everyone here is an electrical engineer, but it is something you have to think about. A lot of owners are going to ask for level three charging stations and not understand the amount of power that is required to get those running is so much higher than what they would get from a, a normal level two. Uh, high end level two charging stations will run you about $7,000. A level three station is about $40,000. And that's just the station itself. That's nothing to do with the installation, which when you're looking at electrical currents like this is significantly higher. So at that point, you have to go and figure out, okay, how many stations does the owner want? What kind of stations do they want? Do they have the electrical capacity to even put these stations in? That is where a lot of the hidden costs are, are with these installations. As you open up the electrical panel and realize there's no room or there's room for one station and they want five. So now you're looking at new electrical panels, new transformers. Uh, potentially, there's not enough power even going to the building, and now you have to get the utilities involved to bring the power out. A lot of the buildings we're going to be working on are pre-built. And when the owners built them, they were not anticipating having to plug 10 electric cars in at the same time. But that is the world we are heading to, both with private vehicles and with government vehicles. And the other thing to keep in mind is a voltage drop. How far away from the electrical panel and transformers does the owner want these stations to be? In a perfect world, we're putting them as close as possible. But a lot of times, they want the electrical panels may be in the back of the building, and they want the stations in the front. And we're looking at two or three hundred feet that we have to run that power out to power those stations, which can be done. 
but now you're definitely have to, you have to figure out how much power is going to be lost trying to get it out there. Are you going to put a sub panel and transformer on an island in front of the building and try to hide it, the power of those stations? So the bottom line is there's a lot more to the installation itself than just which station is the cheapest or what station do they want to put in. So that gets in the planning for the future. So on almost every installation I've done, we do a two plus, et cetera. So they might tell us we want two dual port stations installed now. So that's four different parking spaces, but we're going to run the conduit for an additional three stations. You can see in this picture here, it is much cheaper and, and a lot faster for an owner if we're already going to be trenching and digging up a parking lot to just run a little bit of extra conduit out there now than to try to come back out in three years and dig it all up again. You really want to push to your owners to future-proof their installations. And with EV, we have a saying, if you build it, they will come. A lot of owners are on the fence about buying an EV until they either have one at home or at work. Once those charges start to pop up at these federal installations, more and more are going to be needed. And if you have to go and start all over from scratch every time, you're really going to be um, eating up a lot of costs for the owner. So don't just size for what you need now, size for the future. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about the federal requirements for this later on. But there is a federal federal requirement now to have 100% zero emission vehicles by 2035. And that's government vehicles. But as we push in that direction, that's going to be POVs as well. And last thing I just want to talk about you know, the federal government is getting into this now. Uh, state, county, and um, city governments have been in this for years. We've already been doing work with the city of Manassas for installations for them, Virginia Beach um, Public Schools, Fairfax County. And we're looking at uh, installations for Leesburg County as well, and Prince William um, in Virginia. So there's a lot of this coming in. There's electric school bus programs are being piloted now that that's also going to be used um, potentially for federal buses later on where the batteries on the buses themselves can be used to store energy and then push back into the grid um, to help kind of take care of the peaks and valleys as we go through. But this is not something that's going away. It's something we see exponential growth happening in. And you know, we have to be the ones that are the subject matter experts on this to the federal government, to the owners of these buildings, and really set them up to go in the right direction. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jason. So I'm going to jump in now and talk about uh, the design aspect and specifically design for uh, buildings, uh, which is what what my company does. Um, so most of this is going to be geared towards new buildings. And so I'm going to start off by talking about the, the drivers for uh, installing electric vehicle supply equipment at, at your facility. So if you're, if you're doing federal work, you may already be required to put in charging stations, depending on the, um, the, the agency that, that the project is for. GSA, uh, which is generally civilian federal projects, already requires charging infrastructure and charging equipment. We do a lot of work for the Department of State Overseas uh, Building Operations. They just came out with uh, requirements for electric vehicle charging. And on the military side, the, the UFCs, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, in, in a little bit there, they're not quite 100% there, but they're, they're heading in that direction. Uh, and, and certainly want you to consider EVs. And, and it only makes sense if you're, you know, designing a project today that's, uh, you know, maybe an FY 2024 project or, or beyond. Um, you know, I think everybody can agree there are going to be a lot more electric vehicles on the road by then. Um, only if, if for no other reason than the manufacturers are getting behind them. But um, we're, you know, seeing more and more uh, federal mandates and, you um, and, and the need really to reduce emissions. So we're, we're going to be seeing a lot more of them. The nice thing about electric vehicles, apart from the fact that they, um, you know, the, the cars are, are pretty cool and pretty, pretty fun and pretty fast. Um, they, they give us more ability to not only clean up our grid, but to, to do different things with our grid. And um, Jason kind of touched on that already, you know, the idea of exporting power in the, in the school bus model, but uh, exporting power back to the grid. That's called vehicle to grid. It's um, certainly doable now. Most, um, in fact, I'm not, I'm not really sure of any manufacturer is fully supporting that, but um, it's coming. 
And it's going to allow us to, you know, have, um, think of it as just millions of little remote power packs or mobile power packs that we can, we can plug in and, and do some really cool stuff with. Um, so when you get into a job, what, what kind of governs what, what you need to do with um, electric vehicle charging, you know, how much you need and what you can and can't do. And, and um, there are a few standards, a few codes in place by far the, the most important, or at least the, the most, the, the one with the biggest requirements is going to be the national electrical code NFPA 70 uh, article 625, which has been expanded, uh, include some new stuff in the 2020 version. And I, you know, I'm not going to be able to go through all of this. There's you'll, you'll get these slides and you can see some of the, the notes that I've pulled out, but I, I do want to flag a couple things that are, that are pretty interesting, especially for the new version, the 2020 version. The first is that it sets forth requirements for power export, which is that bi-directional power flow or the vehicle to grid. So, you know, I said most manufacturers aren't quite there in terms of supporting it. Uh, there are plenty of trials going on with it, but it's nice that they're, you know, in anticipation of it because these NEC versions stay around for a while. Um, that, that's that been been set up and, and, and providing a framework for that. Couple other interesting and important um, aspects in, in Article 625 of the NEC, automatic load management system. Um, it, it acknowledges that, um, you know, if you have a whole lot of vehicles or a whole lot of charging it, you know, you could get in a situation where, you know, you, you could have maybe 30, 30 cars charging, but you might not have the infrastructure to support all of that. Um, you can use automatic load management system to to, to decrease uh, the amperage so that you're not overloading your system. Um, there are some, you know, requirements for that. And, and a lot of times the, the, the um, supply equipment itself will have that in there, but it does, it does acknowledge that um, with some controls, you can manage that loading. And um, kind of interestingly, there are provisions to allow the EVs to act as standby power systems. Increasingly, we're seeing, uh, you know, little electrical outlets. Uh, it's no big deal to have, you got a big battery and just to have an inverter and um, have a 120 or even, you know, 240 volt outlet uh, in, a, in a truck, especially we're seeing more of that. And um, that, that's kind of cool. So you could, you know, run a job site or even backfeed your building or cabin or whatever. It's interesting that as soon as that happens, it becomes a regular, as soon as you put a regular outlet on a vehicle like that, then that outlet gets, uh, gets governed by the NEC. Um, but um, yeah, it's a whole, whole new world that we're about to enter into. We're going to have some pretty cool stuff coming. For other federal projects, specifically for DOD type projects, those are governed by unified facilities criteria and uh, UF uh, um, and guide specs. So there are a couple here you'll see that specifically hit on electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, not as extensive as the the NEC, but there are some things that you gotta um, uh, make sure you review covered in, like I said, a few places under electrical systems. Uh, and then there's a guide spec um, specifically dedicated to this equipment. Um, there's a lot there. Big takeaway from that is just, um, well, if you've got, got one on your job, you certainly need to need to review and edit the specification and make sure um, you're meeting the intent. It's a, it's a very mature technology is one thing I want everybody to take away from all this. Uh, they don't want the very newest equipment that's that's never been um that doesn't have any track record whatsoever um but uh yeah please just just review this it all all makes pretty good sense um but just know that this is uh, mature technology and it it it's uh it's ready to get on your project so now i'm going to talk a little bit about lead uh lead most new projects are required to meet some green building rating standard. And, and for most federal projects, that, that ends up being LEED. Uh, LEED version 4.1 is the current um, adopted version or required version for new projects. 
there is a version 4.1 and although it is still technically in beta phase you can use any credits from version 4.1 in version 4.0 and and a lot of times um, a lot of those credits are actually easier than the 4.0 credits one important uh change from 4 to 4.1 4 was um written around green vehicles it did make mention of electric vehicles of course but uh in version 4.1 it's all about electric vehicles and there's just sadly just one point available for uh accommodating electric vehicles and then and, and there's two ways to to go about it the first is you can dedicate you can put in everything you need to serve um support evs um vehicle charging ev charging for five percent of all parking spaces or um so that's the first way and that's that's everything so it's it's ready to go day one the second option uh if you can't quite get there or can't afford it day one is you just put the infrastructure in to support um 10 of all your all your parking spaces and and by infrastructure what that means is you need to make sure your service size is adequate you need to have panel space and circuits uh available or at least space for future circuits and and you need to have that conduit as uh, Jason was mentioned, the, the trenching through the parking lot. And, and absolutely, as he mentioned, go ahead and throw a few more conduits uh, in there or bigger conduits to, to make sure you can um, accommodate future charging. So it, it, it makes sense that, you know, either put it in today or get ready to put in more tomorrow. Uh, for existing buildings, um, there isn't a specific electric vehicle charging credit however there are a whole lot of credits related to transportation performance in general so if um if you're able to incentivize or at least encourage people to have evs to take evs to work you could potentially get a lot more than just one or two points or uh from that because your overall commuting emissions uh could could benefit greatly So um, the biggest thing that I guess the biggest pitfall that, that we see on getting electric vehicles into projects is just not thinking about them early enough, you know, thinking and treating them as an afterthought. And so um, as as more and more they're required and and it's and more and more it's becoming clear that, you know, they're going to be much, much more prevalent in a few years. You need to be talking about them early, um, getting them. A, a real robust discussion into your your planning charrettes not only for personally owned vehicles but um, really dig in and figure out what uh, the owner is likely to have are they going to have fleet vehicles even if it's just a few uh, work trucks uh, but they may have more um, if it's you know some vehicle maintenance facility or something or there may be some military equipment that you know maybe in the process or down the road is um, maybe going electrical or electric. And then, you know, as I said, get into the weeds, figure out where they're going to be, uh, where those spaces for charging are actually going to be, because that that drives a lot of things. As Jason said, you want it as close as possible. So um, do the do the work up front. Uh, and don't, don't again, don't treat it as an afterthought. Um, most electrical systems are required to be designed for at least 20% added capacity. Don't, if you know you're going to have EVs on your job, don't don't eat into that 20% on day one. So um, just be thinking about it early. This kind of builds uh, upon it. It's it's a little at the very earliest phases where you're doing maybe 1391 for for military planning. It's it's a little difficult to get specific line items related to you know sustainability or emissions or, or specific technologies in there. But um, it's not too early to be talking about it, and certainly in the planning process, be talking uh, with owners and tenants as to what whether they're going to have fleet vehicles and work vehicles that need to uh, have charging infrastructure quick note on cybersecurity: every control system uh, related to a building is required to meet this dod um, uh, unified facility criteria for cybersecurity. EV charging equipment would not be an exception. Generally, it would be fairly or it's fairly easy to meet that um, because 
we do not recommend, no, I don't think anybody recommends fully integrating your, your charging equipment with your, say, building an information system or our building automation system or your, your SCADA system. It's best to keep that completely separate. And so you have a third party taking care of all of that. If you, if you need some just general monitoring in terms of usage, that's, that's easy enough to do with some CTs. But um, the, the best approach in meeting cybersecurity is, is to keep the, the um, EV supply equipment completely separate from your building systems and any, any DOD networks. Kind of hit on this already in terms of um, getting your um, thinking about this early. Uh, there are a lot of variables in this, but generally for, for most applications, the service side isn't going to go up dramatically, even if it goes up 20%, which might be kind of on the high end uh, for a typical building. This happens to be our building. Um, I've run run some numbers and it would be between 10 and 20% for our, for our building if it were a new project today. That, that's a whole lot easier to to accommodate than, than it would be to try to um, add it in after the fact. Um, it's just not that big of an increase when you're talking about general building infrastructure. And I'm going to finish up here just uh, talking about um, big stuff, uh, buses, car, uh, trucks, light trucks, and, and big trucks, um, which are also... Um, absolutely coming. In fact, they're already here. Uh, actually, for buses and, and I think a lot of big trucks, we've, we've kind of already crossed the threshold in terms of them being more life cycle cost effective overall. So we, so we know these this type of equipment is coming. This is a different animal. This doesn't really get integrated into the building systems as much as um, just regular level two vehicle charging would be. So this is going to require a more than likely a separate service, as you can see, a whole lot of space, a whole lot of infrastructure. So it's it's different, but it's absolutely important to be thinking about it at the very beginning of, of your project and be talking about it with uh, owners and tenants. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate that. Um, so, so my portion of this this webinar, and I think that you know the the information that Jason and Rob provided for the planning and and thinking ahead is is so important with with federal agencies. Um, there's groups that are way ahead. There's groups that are far behind in the educational curve. So, uh, you know, it, it does take some time, um, but there are lots of really good options and lots of really good resources out out there. So. Um, just to, to kind of touch on the executive order, I saw a question in the chat, and so I, I, I didn't want to give up the goods until uh, later in the webinar, so, so you would stick around and, and, and listen to the details. But um, back in, in uh, 2014, there was an executive order 13693 with the Obama administration that, that kind of really catalyzed all of this. So GSA put out a, a, a blanket purchase agreement that was awarded to a veteran-owned company that I did a lot of work with. And we installed over 2,000 ports of charging stations and charging infrastructure at federal sites. Um, that includes military, civilian, intelligence agencies, and such. So, um, you know, some of, some of the groups have some pretty robust infrastructure already. Uh, lots of level two and some level three, because um, there is some, you know, the, the infrastructure costs more, but there is some, some mission critical needs when it comes to level three charging and being sure that you've got that continuity of operation and, and, and comfort level that you can charge a vehicle up quickly. Uh, now the, the, the vehicle has to accept that power and things like that. So there's lots of variables that I go over with agencies, but um, I've been working on these projects since 2014 and there's lots of really good stuff going on. Um, so now let's fast forward to the Biden administration and the executive order 14057, which is catalyzing uh, clean energy industries and, and even the jobs through federal sustainability. So trying to just uh, kickstart everything that that goes to, you know, to clean energy and the environment. Um, it also federal sustainability plan for emission vehicles by 2035. That number is great to me because you include the heavy, medium, heavy duty and such. 
I think the even better number is um, 100% light duty vehicle acquisitions by 2027. So, you know, they go through cycles and, and, and the agencies go through cycles of, of as their leases come up from GSA leased vehicles, um, you know, they're, they have to flip their the purchases, purchase vehicles out, things like that. So what they're trying to do is just start now. And as you're replacing vehicles, try and try and get all those acquisitions to be uh, to be zero emission by 2027. Um, so then there's a section 204 of the executive order, and it further provides that each agency with a fleet of at least 20 vehicles shall develop and annually update a zero emissions fleet strategy. So I like that because agencies are already doing it. I'm working very closely with many agencies right now where they're trying to maximize that acquisition. Um, you know, they're thinking about light duty now. But when they're putting the infrastructure in, they're thinking of how are we going to charge up these medium and heavy duty vehicles and, and mission critical vehicles as well, you know, when that comes time. So so the the fleets with the larger numbers of, of vehicles um, are really, you know, uh, recommended to, to get started on that um, and think ahead. So the, the, the plan also from there indicates that agencies will be expected to develop and expand the charging infra infrastructure. Um, so that's important because a lot of agencies that I've worked with will do a kind of a shotgun start, I would call it. It's it's let's put in a couple stations, we'll feed a couple of 40 amp circuits, that's 80 amps, and we'll go from there. Um, my best programs that I've worked with think ahead. So they do make ready for, let's say, looking at their fleet, they start determining how many vehicles are in their fleet, how many will be, you know, most feasibly electric. Um, you know, and, and how many vehicles do you want to, you know, charge or have plugs for? So is it a one-to-one -one ratio for you? Is it a four-to-one ratio? Because you have lower, you know, lower daily miles, say 20 or 30 miles in a day, you can cycle those vehicles on throughout the week rather than having to plug them in every night. So you want to think ahead and, and understand that you want to expand that infrastructure early so you don't have to redig, retrench, things like that. And Jason will surely give you some really good stories if you reach out to him on, 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 on groups that, you know, that, that didn't think ahead. And then you're redigging every time you have to add stations to your, to your process. Also, especially military bases, thinking about where you want to put, put them ahead of time. We'll put a couple here. And then on this other side of the base, we'll do a couple, um, spreading them out, making them convenient for the, for the GOVs, but also thinking ahead for personal vehicles and, we're on the site that, you know, it's going to be most feasible to, to charge and make it easy on everyone and, and that type of thing. And we'll get into the process around that a little bit later. Um, so so one the first question I always get is, are we allowed to do this? Uh, and actually dating back to 2015 and still in place and still good to go is the FAST Act. So that's fixing America's surface transportation. Um, it was, I was a year, about a year and a half into, or a year or so into uh, working with agencies on uh, POV charging and just charging infrastructure itself and, and getting those stations, you know, up and running for the fleet. Um, and so some of those agencies said, well, we only have one fleet vehicle. Can we open this up to other vehicles? The FAST Act allowed them to do that. So it gave them authority, authority to do that. Um, so I gave a little quote here at the top, um, but also some of the really important bullets within are you allow employees to charge their EVs on current stations. So you have those fleet vehicles. And if it's smart charging, you can have P GOVs charged during nighttime and POVs during the day, and you collect the funds through a third party and, and they're reimbursed. And we'll get into, the agency is reimbursed. So we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Um, so now you also can, this allows agencies to fund the purchase of charging stations to be used for POV charging, as long as you, uh, show that you're going to make a good faith effort to, you know, make that revenue neutral. So you're not going to make money, but you're not going to lose, lose money over time. Um, so the requirement was you have to charge to charge. You cannot give uh, free charging away. Can't give away free electricity. Um, lots of an anecdotes and stories around that, especially in the military area where, where non-network stations were, uh, were being used when they shouldn't be. Um, and you couldn't lock them down, uh, but you couldn't get someone to stop using it unless you really, you know, uh, tried to put your foot down and things like that. And, and there's lots of stories I can share around that. 
the FAST Act does give some parameters around that, the DOE guidance that's referenced above in 2016, which is a little outdated now, but it's still really good information. And it's on DOE's workplace charging website, but it requires 10 year payback for the hardware and the software and services. Forty years for the infrastructure. So that capex, it does take time because you don't want to price gouge people using it. You want it to get used. Um, you don't want it to just sit there and not be used. So it's it's. I go through this exercise with a lot of agencies. I've done it with dozens already, uh, and there's so many variables. But the best program out there is one that I worked on with FBI in multiple locations across the country, and it's there. They always the contact I had there always said the best good faith effort. So you just you just want to make sure you're showing that you're going to try and do this over that time. The 10 years of the hardware, a way that that can, that can work is maybe the agency can get some funding and CapEx funding for fleet EV charging or whatever it may be and transfer ownership to, let's say, Navy can use their, their exchange services and things like that. And then that payback gets to be shorter and you know they could ultimately make money on it as well. So there's lots of really good examples out there. The, the bottom bullet's the most important. You've got to have a good software package and a good network charging station. It's critical to controlling the access, setting up pricing, getting the reimbursements, making it simple on the agency, uh, seamless and simple. Uh, just a quick time check here. So some of the bullets that I go through with agencies as they plan and implement these programs, um, you know, you've got to think ahead. And Jason touched on this quite a bit. But, you know, you may have the accessibility to do a garage install, which sometimes it's a little bit tougher with permitting, but it's a lot cheaper when it comes to conduit and not having to dig and trench and things like that. Also, getting close to the to the power, both the Rob and Jason said that, and I'll reiterate that that is super important. Um, some agencies get really stuck on where they want to put the station and, and it's hard to 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 move that. But, you know. Installers are very, very, very keen on coming out and doing a site walk, helping you with, uh, you know, with thinking ahead and, 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 you know, what you need to think about. So definitely, you know, connect with us to, to you know, do something like that. Um, using your fleet assets for POV programs is the best. Charge GOVs during the day. Uh, POV, I'm sorry, POVs during the day, GOVs at night. Uh, it really makes dual use of the asset and, and you know, government is supposed to be the steward of the, the taxpayer dollar and we all want them to use it wisely. And that's that's a great way to do it. Um, there is a DOE spreadsheet. So it's it's kind of a cost reimbursement form. Um, I have have several agencies that have tweaked it to their, you know, specific process. Um, but I, I do have examples of that and happy to, you know, you'll have our contact information at the end. I'm happy to go over the, those in detail. I'll give some examples here before we finish up. I already, already mentioned the good faith efforts. Um, you know, planning how much to charge POVs is another thing. Depends on the state. Depends on, uh, you know, you want to have high usage, but you know, you you want to avoid the squatters that'll just sit there and and you know, maybe it's it's cheap throughout, and they can just leave their car on the station. Um, you want to give them incentive to get off. So raising the price after a number of hours or when they're done charging and they get an alert through the, you know, their, the, their phone app um, or something like that. That's, that's the best way to do it, but you want to keep it fair and you want to keep usage up. Um, how will the agency be reimbursed? We'll get into a couple examples, but the DOE guidance and, and fast act does state that you need to reimburse through a treasury account. Um, but there are so many ways that I've come up with not I've come up with, but I've worked with agencies to to implement, um, you know, military systems like GFEBs. You've got utility reimbursements, lockboxes. Um, the key is they've just got to be able to accept that reimbursement because to make it seamless, the third party like a charge point will collect the money and on a monthly basis, return it to the government uh, and process everything. And government doesn't have to, to worry about it or touch it. So um, it's 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 really important in the process. I'm not going to go really into detail here. You know, Jason talked quite a bit about this, but, you know, the key here is the network charging station and and having a dashboard where you can, you know, take a quick look at, at energy usage and consumption. You don't have to have a separate meter for the station. It's all metered internally. You can see revenue reports. You can see greenhouse gas savings. Um, you know, if you're an agency that has 
like the Marine Corps that I've been working with, they have, you know, 14 bases that are, that are putting in stations and they want to have a full view, but they want the actual bases to have their own control. You can do that hierarchy within the software and, and, you know, change policies and, and, and adjust as needed as time goes on. But you can, with this control access, um, it all goes back to the, you know, to the fast act and having to charge to charge and, and that type of thing. But then you can price any way you want. And I touched on this, but price per hour, per kilowatt hour, time of day, um, you know, is it a contractor versus an employee versus a GOV? Um, within this, you can actually have the GOVs use their WEX card uh, to, you know, to log into the station. And, and if they're offsite to do the same, and it all rolls up into the reporting that's that's out of that dashboard. Um, then also ways to just control on and off, you know, driver services when they're fully charged, they'll, they'll be able to know if the stations are in use at the beginning of the day and they want to get on a wait list. Um, you know, you can have, you can control the on and off and get, get the most out of your assets. You don't need a station for every employee, you know, FDA and white Oak has 36 ports for their entire campus. Um, and it, and it does pretty well though. They'll, they'll add some soon, but, uh, COVID has kind of delayed that. So a uh, couple more slides here, just a touch on it. I've, I've named these as I've gone, but the there are several POV charging programs and I've been intimately involved in all of these. So please reach out. Even if you're a large company or a small company that's working with an agency, come to me, you know, let's, 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 you know, get it done right. But you can see there's a couple of DOD agencies. There's a large pilot at Fort Benning and Fort Irwin. Um, east and West Coast that's that's up and running. I mentioned FDA and I mentioned FBI. Um, there's national parks. A lot of times they'll have stations donated and they'll give away free charging. They can kind of get away with that. But there are parks that, that you know, they want to see who's coming to their park. And, and these network stations can show them data like that, uh, where they're coming from and that type of thing. Um, EPA and Research Triangle Park has a nice program. Lawrence Livermore National Lab has a good program. Um, and then some of these GSA examples, uh, out in California, there's a bunch of sites that, that have charge point stations, uh, Denver federal center, um, DHS. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. There's, there's dozens I've worked with. So agencies will call me and think there's no chance they can get this done. And then when we start digging in, they get, they get pretty excited. Um, some of the other programs, uh, and then I just have a couple pictures and, and I'm done. Uh, but. TVA, I work really closely with them. Um, they're, you know, a utility, but they're also a federal agency in itself. Uh, but they actually launched a program where they bought a, a, a large number of fast chargers and level twos. And they're, uh, they've got a program to where groups can apply and states and, you know, the states or the municipalities and co-ops or uh, even private industry to some extent. Uh, they're just trying to, you know, get that network of charging. So people have lose that range anxiety. Uh, and, and feel comfortable they can get a charge when they're out and about. Um, you know, Jason touched on this, but that includes getting stations at workplaces. And, and you know, if you can charge at home and at work, uh, then the, you only need the rest of the infrastructure for when you're, work, you're uh, you know, taking a long drive. I've driven an EV since 2017. So it's been um, just nice to see it expand and make it easier uh, to, to charge. So the other two programs I mentioned, the U.S. Marine Corps, I want to mention this because they're actually mounting these stations on, on solar EV arcs. Um, so then they, they can deploy them quickly. They're portable, but yet permanent. Um, they're fully integrated with charge point units and they can control all the access. So although we talk a lot about on-grid here, um, that's going to be the tried and true. But you can enhance your program by, by doing something that's, that's off-grid. Um, you can even tie it into current, you know, solar PVs and, and that type of thing. The last one is this DHS program. Um, it's going to get quite expansive, but there's a lot going on with CBP and Federal Law Enforcement Training Center and FEMA. And they're mixing on-grid with off-grid with battery storage. Um, you know, I do some work with a company called Freewire that has a battery integrated station that when you you can pull from 208, store it in the battery and push it out at 150 kilowatts to the vehicle at fast charging rates compared to level two that's, you know, seven kilowatts. Lots of really cool, cool stuff going on to, to support this, this infrastructure because it's going to be a lift.
Um, oh, I, I, I did want to touch on this. This is actually a lot of information, uh, but we're getting toward the end of the time. So I can certainly dig into this further. Uh, Rob did touch on the cybersecurity part of this. We do want these siloed off. So they are cellular connections. Everything's encrypted. So you've got from the top down, you've got at the station, they're going to securely log into the station through an RFID process. Everything's encrypted at rest in transit as it goes from the station to the cloud. So that's that second tier. It uses a private IP network, um, you know, and, and it doesn't rely on third party systems to, to for connectivity. It never touches a federal system. Um, you go down to the mobile application, which is all two factor authentication and and, you know, nothing gets stored as far as payments down to the cloud. So mobile to cloud, you've got the end to end encryption. Um, again, all of this data is is uh, packetized and sent over the airwaves and, and, and it lands on a server that for federal sites with the charge point stations that I've, I've, I work with a, a large percentage of the time. Um, they land on an AWS server that's actually FedRAMP certified and, and that type of thing. Soon, um, the requirement from GSA is going to be to be either FedRAMP certified or a NIST 800-171. So these are just third-party certifications that make the government comfortable that, you know, everything that we say is, is being done, you know, the way it should. So then I touched on it already at the bottom, but within the cloud, you're going to have encryption, you're going to have you know, no, no payment information is stored there. It's all tokenized, um, all that good stuff. So just the leave behind on this slide is make sure you understand that it is important for federal sites to think about security, keep it siloed. You can integrate these, these applications, but just be careful and, and make sure you're not opening up channels to, you know, to, to bad intentions and bad, you know, bad actors. Um, I worked for a company called Hacker One for a little bit where they actually, you know, proactively uh, do pen testing on stations through researchers and things like that. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, the last thing I did this is just really just examples. So some some pretty cool looking types of layouts. So you've got a program to the bot to the left. That's those are the DC fast charging charge point stations. Um, you've got that middle picture that's a nice rollout where you can see you straddle two spots. It looks really nice. You see the cord management that Jason talks about. This, this right-hand side are fleet stations. So they're purely for fleet, but they're still connected and still controlled through the software. These are the EV arcs I talked about mounted with charge point stations um, you know, uh, at a Marine Corps site. Finally, this last bottom right-hand corner, you can see this tiny little station, but it's just an awesome picture. It's uh, NOAA, uh, and it's it's part of the Department of Interior, and they've got the station for their fleet vehicles there at this this cool little uh, federal site with the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in the background and all that good stuff. So that's what I've got. I hope I didn't go too close to the end of the time, but um, here's our information, and I'm sure someone will 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 take over from here. But please do reach out with questions. Uh, we all have our, our lanes, Rob, I, and Jason. So, um, please do not hesitate. We're here to help. Great. Thanks. We do have, um, a couple of questions that came through and I, let me get to that. Um, Okay, so, um, and uh, I don't know if somebody, the first question that came through was asking specifically for the number um, for that executive order. So, um, uh, who asked that? Phil, if you have the handout, there is a slide with the specific executive orders listed on there. Um, let's see, the next question was from Norm, um, and um, Matt, I think you had referenced a veteran-owned small business from 2014, and Norm was asking to see if you were able to yep. tell us who that was. 
Yeah, that the company name was Apollo SunGuard. Um, they're a service disabled veteran owned small business and they were awarded a blanket purchase agreement in 2014, as well as another one in 2017, which finishes up in 2022 here in the next few months. But GSA has some procurement actions to uh, award some new blanket purchase agreements. So um, they're seamlessly having that go through. So the agencies have a really simple and easy way to buy and procure these stations and it works really well. Our next question is from Michelle. Um, it's kind of a two-part question, but with the federal government moving to EV for the fleet, does the government need to think about microgrid solutions for the EV charging stations? And then can EV charging stations be added to an existing microgrid? I can um, start this anyway. This is this is Rob. So. Uh, absolutely, they, they should be thinking about it uh, for for microgrids. In other words, um, you know, it's a it's an additional load that that needs to be accounted for. Uh, what's what's really cool of, about the idea of integrating EVs is um, eventually, and not uh, too too long, you know, a couple of years maybe, uh, we'll have the ability to go. The, to, to implement this bi-directional power supply. So the, the power uh, control system that's um, part of um, the um, section uh, 7, 706 and 7, well, 705 uh, surrounding microgrids is, is gonna become very important is just integrating the charging into um, the overall microgrid control. And that, that way you'll be able to, you know, maybe disable charging when you, you can't really um, spare the power, but um, ultimately you'll be able to have two-way power flow. So it just needs to get um, incorporated into the architecture. I'll, I'll add, this is Matt, I'll add just, and that's perfect answer, Rob, and in, in my experience in microgrids with, at federal sites, um, just understand that most of the charging infrastructure can handle it. The, the key to that is that there hasn't been a lot of real good use cases. Um, so most Charging station vendors will 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 jump at the chance to have a, a good conversation and a good use case and, and and show this. I know Navy's done a lot of really cool stuff out west with microgrids and integrating charging and battery storage and that type of thing. So, um, but yeah, it's it's the, the stations for the most part can handle it. It's just getting the you know appropriate use cases. Um, one other question, um, and I don't know who can speak to this, but um, just what is the, how quickly are people adopting or, you know, purchasing EVs? Like, I'm assuming that at some point um, the percentage of um, required EV spaces will have to change for new construction as, you know, more people have EVs and, you know, need them at work or wherever else. Yeah, and I, I can speak to the DC area um, specifically that they're already requiring for new construction 20% of parking spaces to be EV ready. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a charger installed, but that you have the electrical infrastructure and the conduit already built in um, for that. So that's you know that's 20% of new construction building parking spaces, and we expect that that's going to be bleeding into the Virginia and Maryland side as well. Uh, if I had to guess with the federal government um, installations, especially in the D.C. area, will probably follow suit. So it's, it's going to be substantial and it's going to be happening pretty quickly. And back to what I was talking to earlier is just you know, traditional construction does not have that much extra power available, especially in the parking garage to, uh, to accommodate that. Okay, thanks. Um, we are approaching the end of the hour here. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, right now, but um, for those, again, that, um, you know, had to drop off um, early, um, the recording for this webinar will be available on the SMU web. Uh, information on this. Uh, slide. Um, please feel free to uh, reach out to them if you have follow-up questions, if you weren't able to ask them 
um, today on this call. Um, somebody also had asked about PDH certificates. That will also be available on the SAME website uh, for those who um, have watched this webinar. Um, again, thank you to Rob, Matt, and Jason for taking the time to talk to us about this topic. I thought it was pretty, it was really interesting. So um, if there aren't any other comments, um, I will um, end this webinar here. Um, and um, yeah, look forward to kind of seeing where EVs go in the future. Thanks, everyone.